Hello, third grade, and welcome to unit four, week four. Let's get started with our vocabulary words for this week. Your first word is the word passenger. So a passenger is a person who's traveling in a vehicle. So the passengers are in, in the car are all of the people who are riding in the car. You've got your driver and then everyone else is a passenger. Uh, passengers on an airplane when you're traveling from one place to another. So again, passenger just means the person that's traveling in some kind of vehicle, whether it's a car, a plane, a train, a boat, anything. Next, we have the word impossible. When something is impossible, it can't be done. It's not possible. Remember, it has that prefix I-M, the M means not. So impossible means something that is not possible. Our next word is the word launch. When people launch something, they send that thing into, into the sky or into space. So you can launch um, a plane, into the sky, you can, you've seen that they've launched rockets into the sky, the satellites that are up there now were launched into the sky. So that just means you're sending something up into the sky or into space. Number four is popular. Something that's popular is liked by a lot of people. So it could be a popular flavor of ice cream that a lot of people like or a popular book that a lot of people are reading. So popular just means something that's accepted or liked by a lot of people. Next, we have the word direction. Direction is the way that you're going. So if you ask someone to point you in the direction of the park, they're going to show you where to go or the way to get there. Or if you get directions to your favorite bookstore, it's going to tell you which way to turn on the different streets so that you can reach it. Next, we have the word controlled. If something is controlled, it's adjusted or moved by something else. So think of like a remote control car. You're controlling it, right, using something else. So it's not moving by itself. It's moving because you're making it move a certain way. Number seven is the word flight. A flight is when something is moving through the air. So a bird takes flight, right? It flies through the air. An airplane takes flight. And our last word is the word motion. Motion just means movement. So the balloon made a swaying motion in the wind or a swaying movement in the wind. Those words are synonyms of each other. Now for our spelling words this week, we're going to focus on words called homophones. Homophones are words that sound the same, but they have a different meaning and they have different spelling. So I've given you a couple of examples so you'll understand what I'm talking about. So you have the word sale and sale, right? S-A-L-E -E means when you go to the store and something is a lower price than it usually is. Or sale, S-A-I-L, it's that giant piece of cloth that helps catch the wind and helps the boat move along. Then you have beet and beet. Beet with two E's is the vegetable that's kind of got that purple red color. Or B-E-A-T means to win or to pass. So if you beat someone in a race. Next, we have the words road, road, and road. So numbers five, six, and seven. R-O-D-E is a past tense of ride. So today we will ride our bikes. Yesterday we rode our bikes. R-O-A-D is the thing that you're driving on when you're in the car. That's you're driving on the road. Or we have road, R-O-W-E-D, which means that, which is a past tense of rowing, like when you row a boat. Then we have the words it's and it's. So one of them has an apostrophe and one does not. I-T-S with no apostrophe means something that belongs to it. So it shows ownership, it's a possessive. It's is a possessive pronoun. So this is its ball or where is its bed, I-T-S. When you have it apostrophe S, that's a contraction. Remember contractions are when we take two words and squish them together to make one shorter word. So it's is a combination of it is. So it's cold outside. And if you're ever not sure which one you're supposed to use, try substituting it is. If when you put in the words it is, your sentence still makes sense, then that's the right one, the one with the apostrophe. If it doesn't make sense anymore, then it's probably the other one. Next we have your and your. So Y-O-U-R, again, is another possessive. It means something that belongs to you, like your pencil. Y-O-U-R apostrophe R-E is another contraction. That's U plus R. Like you are going with us, 
to the park. You are going with us to the park. Same thing with the contractions. If you're not sure if that's what you're supposed to be using, separate it out into its word parts so that you can see if it still makes sense. So if I'm not sure which your to use in the sentence, this is your backpack, I'm gonna try splitting it into you are. I don't say this is you are backpack, so that one can't be right. This is your backpack, the one with no apostrophes and no E at the end because that one shows ownership. All right, the next set of homophones we have are the words there, there, and there. And I know you've only got two of them over here, so I'll focus on these for a moment, but we're going to talk more about it farther down. There, T-H-E-I-R, is something when you're saying something that belongs to them. This is their car. I went to their house. Uh, we watched a movie on their TV, T-H-E-I-R. There, T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E is another contraction. It's a contraction of the words they are. They are going with us to the park. So you can split it up. They are going with us to the park. It still makes sense. Next, we have peace and peace. P-E-A-C-E -E means there's no fighting. There's no disagreements. Everyone is at peace. Everybody's happy. Then there's P-I-E-C-E. -E which means a part of something, a part of the whole, like a piece of pie or a piece of pizza. Next, we have taught and talked, which sound somewhat similar. Taught, T-A-U-G-H-T, is the past tense of teaching. So I am teaching you a grammar lesson. Last week, I taught you a different grammar lesson. Talked, T-A-L-K-E-D, comes from talking. It's the past tense of talk. So I will talk with you after class, or we talked yesterday. And then your, your review and bonus words are bought, seen, and seen. So seen, S-E-E-N, is a past tense of see, like I have seen this movie before. S-C-E-N-E -E is like a scene in a movie, like you're watching uh, the scene where, where they're rescuing someone from a tower, or you're watching a scene where they're having to you know, fight the bad guys in the movie. All right, so let's talk some more about homophones. So homophones, the word homophone is made up of two roots, two different parts. Homo, which means the same, and phone, P-H-O-N, the root, not the word P-H-O-N-E. Phone, which means sound. So we're talking about things that have the same sound and only the same sound. The spelling is different and the meanings are different. So here's some examples, some important ones. So there, there, and there, this one has all three. And this is a fun little visual for you to look at that's um, really helpful and it makes it easy for you to imagine it in your head. So T-H-E-I-R means belonging to them. So it belongs to a person or a group of people, right? So you can imagine that I as a little person. If I say T-H-E-R-E, -E, this has the word here in it. So you can see I highlighted it. Here and there, we're talking about a place. That's your clue word. When you're talking about the form of the word there, that means a place, if it, it has the word here hidden in it. So there, so think about that T-H-E-R-E, -E, like that R is pointing you to a direction over there. And there, T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, -E, again, we said it's a contraction. So here what they did was instead of that apostrophe, they put a little letter A on top to remind you that it's they are. Now our other contractions are two, two, and two. So these are ones that are, that are uh, mistaken often. People make mistakes with them a lot. So two, T-O means a direction or it's a connecting word in a sentence. I am going to the store. Do you want to go to the store with me? Or T-O-O, -O, which means a lot or also, or you can say, I am too tired, like I'm, I'm very tired, or I want to play too. You can say, I want to play also. Or T-W-O, which is the number two. I have two pencils on my desk. And the last ones we're going to focus on today are your and your. So Y-O-U apostrophe R-E is a contraction of U plus R. So you are a great friend. If I can substitute you are in place of it and it still makes sense, that's the correct one I need to use. So I can say you are a great friend, that makes sense. 
I hope you are coming with us on the field trip. That makes sense. The other form of your, Y-O-U-R, shows ownership. That's a possessive pronoun. So is this your backpack? Please put your shoes on. Please take off your coat. So your, Y-O-U-R, is when you're talking about something that somebody owns, something that belongs to them. So those are going to be our homophones, uh, our general idea and covering of homophones for this week. Next, we're going to get into multiple meaning words. So these are words that um, have, that are spelled the same, that sound the same, but they have a different meaning. And these ones we're going to learn about another time, but these are called um, homonyms. Homonyms have the same spelling and the same pronunciation. You say them the same way, but they have a different meaning. So you can keep that word in the back of your mind, homonyms. And we'll cover it. I don't think we're covering it this year. I believe you guys cover homonyms next year, but at least you'll know what they are. So homonyms are basically multiple meaning words. It's one word that depending on how you're using it in a sentence, it can mean something different. So I gave you a couple of examples. So the first one I gave you is the word left. If I tell you there were only two elephants left, am I talking about left as in the opposite of right, like right and left, different directions? Or am I talking about something that is remaining? So you can use your context clues to figure out which meaning of the word that I'm talking about. So when I read the sentence, there were only two elephants left, that means there were only two elephants remaining. I use my context clues. Now, if I have the word duck, I can say duck and cover under your desk in an earthquake. Now duck has more than one meaning, right? I can say duck like, you know, the, the animal that flies goes quack, 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 quack. Or I can say duck, meaning to squat down under something. Next, we have the word point. Please point me in the right direction. So a point can be like the tip of something, like a needle, like a sharp point. Or a point can be um, something you score in a game. You earned five points or 10 points. Or it can mean to direct you towards something. So when you look at the sentence, please point me in the right direction, I know that I'm using that third meaning. Next, we have the word rose. We watched as the plane rose into the air. So rose can be a kind of flower, right? I bought a, a, a red rose at the fair, or it can be, it can mean to go up, to go up into the air. So if we watch the plane as it rose into the air, we know that we're talking about the second meaning. So this is what I mean when I tell you guys, use your context clues, use the words around the word that you're focused on to help guide you. It's there to give you clues and give you direction. And the last example that I put down for you is the word test. We took a long test yesterday. So test can mean the work that you do at school, right? Or it could mean to try something out if you're testing out a new game or you're testing out a new strategy on how to win at tic-tac-toe, for example. So if I say we took a test yesterday, we took a long test yesterday, I know I'm probably talking about school. So I'm using those context clues and words that are around my bolded word to figure out the meaning. All right, the next part that we're going to talk about is called complex sentences. So I'm going to introduce this and then I'm going to break it down into the parts for you. Now a complex sentence is a sentence that contains or has in it an independent clause and a dependent clause. It's got both of those things. So an independent clause and then one or more dependent clause. Now we know an independent clause can stand alone as a sentence. It can be a sentence all by itself. Think of it as a simple sentence, right? Very short, very basic, but it still meets all of the rules and requirements for it to be a sentence. A dependent clause cannot be its own sentence because it doesn't make sense. It's missing information. That's why we call it a dependent clause. It's depending on the rest of the sentence or on those extra words to make it whole. Now, let's break these down into those meaning words and into the tiny little parts so we understand it. So we talked about clauses, right? An independent clause and a dependent clause. So what's a clause? A clause is a group of words that has a subject and a verb. And there are two kinds of clauses that we just mentioned, an independent clause and a dependent clause. <clears throat> 
an independent clause can stand alone as a sentence. What does that mean? That means it has all the parts that it needs to be a sentence all by itself. It doesn't have a comma in it usually. It's very simple, right? The boy runs. That is a simple sentence. That is an independent clause. We have our subject, which is the boy, and the verb runs. The kitten hers, right? Very, very simple, very basic, no details. Just gives you the bare minimum that you need to make it a sentence. Now, a dependent clause doesn't work this way. It has to be introduced. It has to start with something that we call subordinating conjunctions. And when a dependent clause begins a sentence, so that means there's more after it to make it whole, it usually has a comma after that dependent clause. So some of the subordinating conjunctions that we have are the words after, because, if, unless, while, until, when, and before. There are other ones, but these are the ones we're going to focus on because these are the most common ones. So what do I mean when I say dependent clause? Now, if I'm talking about a dependent clause, I'm going to talk about just the part up to that, um, up to that comma. So after we finish our homework. If I told you that by itself, I said, after we finish our homework, and you, you'll look at me and you'll say, what, after you finish your homework, what? What's supposed to happen? Or what are you going to do after you finish your homework? It's not a complete thought, right? It's missing information. That's what makes it a dependent clause. So after we finish our homework, comma, we can play outside. Now that sentence makes sense. Now we have all of the parts, that complete thought that makes up a complete sentence. It starts with our independent, or it starts with our dependent clause, and our dependent clause begins with one of these subordinating conjunctions. So this clause is this group of words, followed by a comma, and then the rest of the sentence. The next example I put is using the word because. Because of the rain, comma, we couldn't go to the beach. So if you came up to me and you said, Miss Zena, because of the rain. I don't know what you're talking about, right? You need to give me more information. What happened because of the rain? So if you get one of these clauses or phrases and it doesn't make sense because it's missing information, it's probably a dependent clause, right? It's depending on other words to help it make sense. Our next one is the word if. So if you finish your chores, comma, we can watch a movie. Next, we have unless. Unless we buy apples, we can't make apple pie. So again, if you're looking at these dependent clauses by themselves, they don't make sense if those are the only parts that you're saying. You need the rest of that sentence to help it make sense. So next we have while I read the story. Well, while I read the story, what? What happened? While I read the story, my sister drew pictures. So now it makes sense. Until the rain stops, we will play board games. So until the rain stops is my dependent clause. It begins with the word until, has a comma, and then it tells me what we're going to do. Next, we have the word when. When we write neatly, our teacher is happy. And last, we have before. Before we saw the lightning, we heard thunder. So what you're seeing in a lot of these is an, a dependent clause and an independent clause. I can tell you, we can play outside. That makes sense. We couldn't go to the beach. That makes sense. You can watch a movie. That makes sense. So when you're starting a sentence with a dependent clause, you have to begin with a subordinating conjunction and have a comma at the end of it. Then you add the independent clause. Now, if I turned these sentences around, let's take a look at this first sentence one more time. After we finish our homework, comma, we can play outside. I can turn the sentence around and say, we can play outside after we finish our homework. Then I won't need that comma anymore because I'm starting with an independent clause. Remember what we set up here. When an independent clause begins the sentence, it is usually not followed by a comma. It doesn't need the comma. A dependent clause, over here we said, when a dependent clause begins a sentence, it is usually followed by a comma. So that applies to all of these sentences. 
Now remember, we said a complex sentence has an independent clause and a dependent clause. And if it has a dependent clause or begins with a dependent clause, that dependent clause is introduced by a subordinating conjunction. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about are compound sentences. Now, these are a lot easier. Compound sentences is basically when you take two sentences that are talking about basically the same thing and you put them together to make them into one longer sentence. They usually have a comma and the word and or or in between to connect those two sentences or those two sentences. So I can say, we will go to the park, comma, or we'll go to the beach. I bought an apple pie, comma, and we took it to the picnic. So they're talking about the same general things. We're just connecting them because when you connect sentences and you make compound sentences, it does make your reading more interesting instead of a bunch of very short choppy sentences that get really boring when you're reading them. We will go to the park. We will go to the beach. I bought a pie. We will take it. We took it to the picnic. So when you're adding things, when you're creating these complex and these compound sentences, they make your writing more interesting to read. So those are things to keep in the back of your head when you're doing your writing. Make sure you come back and revisit this section about complex sentences, independent and dependent clauses and subordinating conjunctions as often as you need to. I do suggest you have it open in front of you when you're doing your work. Um, it'll help just refresh your memory as you go along. Also at the top of your pages in all of your workbooks, they do give you little reminders about these things, in those top boxes. Make sure you're reading those before you begin your assignment. All right, next let's get into our reading. So we're in our literature anthology book and we're going to be reading a story called Hot Air Balloons. And this is an expository text. Now remember we said expository texts are writings that give us information. They're telling us something, they're giving us facts. They usually have diagrams or pictures, they have captions, they have headers and bold faced words. All of these things are different parts of uh, text features that you find in an expository text. So let's go ahead and get started. Genre, expository text. Essential question. How are people able to fly? Read to find out what it's like to fly in a hot air balloon. Hot Air Balloons by Dana Meachin Rao Ready for takeoff. It is early morning. People unload a huge colorful bag in an open field. They turn on a strong fan. They aim it into the opening of the bag. The bag starts to grow. It's a balloon. But it isn't the kind of balloon you get at a birthday party. This balloon is taller than 16 men. Suddenly fire roars into the balloon. It starts to rise. People climb into the basket under the balloon, while others hold it steady. Then the balloon takes off, carrying its passengers into the sky. They float higher than the houses, higher than the trees, up to where the birds fly. Can you imagine what it would be like to float so high? Cars would look like tiny dots. You'd be able to see for miles. The wind would be your guide. What would it feel like to ride with the wind? Hot air is lighter than cool air. A burner heats the air in a balloon so it will rise from the ground. The fabric of a balloon slowly inflates until it is full. Balloon riders get a bird's eye view. Jean Pierre Blanchard crossed the English Channel from England to France in a balloon. Ballooning history. Throughout history, people have wondered what it would be like to fly. The Chinese watched their kites move with the wind. The Greeks told stories of men who made wings to help them fly. People drew pictures of flying machines. But flying seemed impossible. In the late 1700s in France, the Montgolfier, mont gol fi -a, brothers noticed something about paper and fire. If paper got too close to the flames, it burned. 
but they saw that if the paper was above the fire, the hot smoke seemed to make it float and rise. So in 1783, they made a balloon out of paper and silk. They lit a fire under it. People were amazed when the Montgolfier brothers sent a sheep, a duck, and a rooster as passengers in this first hot air balloon. The animals had a successful flight. Soon after, two men rode in a Montgolfier balloon. They traveled more than five miles for twenty-five minutes. Early inventors drew pictures of unbelievable flying machines. Greek stories tell of Daedalus and his son Icarus, who made their own flying wings. Other French people made balloons filled with gas called hydrogen. Hydrogen can rise like hot air does. In 1785, Jean-Pierre Blanchard flew a gas balloon over the English Channel, a waterway between England and France. He also flew the first balloon in America. George Washington watched Blanchard's balloon launch in 1793 from Pennsylvania on its way to New Jersey. Ballooning became very popular. Pilots tried flying balloons higher and farther than ever before. People found uses for balloons during war. Balloons could carry messages. They could spy from the sky. Soldiers used balloons to scout out the battlefield. The stiff framework of an airship helped the balloon keep its shape. By the early 1900s, airships flew in the sky. An airship had a gas-filled balloon with a frame to give it a sausage shape. The basket in which people rode, called the gondola, was enclosed and often very large. It also had an engine and propellers. Pilots could steer these new types of balloons in the direction they wished to go. Some airships were used in war. Others were used for travel, and the gondolas looked like fancy hotels inside. In the early 1900s, the Wright brothers also flew the first airplane. After that, people rode airplanes for travel instead. But people didn't forget about balloons. They built gas balloons that could study the weather and even travel around the world. In 1960, modern hot air balloons were developed by Ed Yost and were later used for sport. Today, people join hot air balloon clubs. Teams hold balloon races. Passengers take rides in the sky to see the beautiful land below. The Wright brothers' first airplane gave people another way to travel the sky. The burner heats the air inside the envelope to inflate the balloon. How Hot Air Balloons Work The science called physics helps us understand how hot air balloons rise in the sky. Physics is the science of how things move. Air is all around you. You can't see it, but you can feel it when the wind blows. Air also has weight. Hot air is light. Cold air is heavy. That means that hot air rises up in the sky. Cold air sits closer to the ground. A hot air balloon works because the hot air trapped inside the balloon is lighter than the cold air outside the balloon. So the balloon rises up into the sky. At a balloon festival, many balloons take off at the same time. Stop and check. Reread. What causes a balloon to rise in the air? Reread page 351 to find the answer. Crowds wait for the big launch. The big balloon is called an envelope. Most envelopes are larger on the top and narrower on the bottom. They come in all colors. The envelope is made out of strong, light cloth called nylon. Just like a paper envelope holds a letter, the balloon envelope holds the hot air. Pilots heat the air in the balloon with a burner. The burner 
sends out a huge flame into the envelope. When the balloon is full of hot air, it starts lifting off the ground. A basket hangs below the burner. This basket carries the pilot and the passengers. The basket is light, but strong enough to carry several people. Some baskets can carry up to 20 passengers at a time, if the balloon is big enough to lift them. When the pilot wants the balloon to go up, he fires up the burner. This can be very loud. The flame grows bigger. It heats the air in the envelope so the balloon will rise. When the pilot wants the balloon to go down, he pulls a cord that lets out some of the hot air. The cord opens the parachute valve. The parachute valve is a cut-out circle of nylon in the top of the balloon. The balloon stops rising. As more hot air escapes, the balloon sinks toward the ground. A basket hangs below the balloon to hold passengers. Up to the wind You turn your handlebars to steer your bike, but a pilot can't steer a balloon. He can make it fly higher or lower, but he can't make it go from side to side. He needs some help from the wind. Wind moves in different directions. Wind might be moving one way high in the sky. It might be moving another way lower in the sky. These paths of wind are called currents. A pilot uses these currents to move the balloon from place to place. He moves the balloon up and down with the burner and parachute valve. When he finds a current going in the direction he wants to go, he lets the balloon ride the wind, right or left. Balloon pilots use wind currents to push them in the direction they want to go. Pilots can't control how fast or how slow the balloon moves. That's controlled by the wind. But too much wind can be dangerous. It can tear the balloon or send it in the wrong direction so pilots always check the weather. A day with clear skies and not too much wind is best for ballooning. They often launch right after the sun comes up, when the wind is calm and the air is cool. They can also launch in the evening, but must land before the sun sets. Balloons don't usually land in the same place they started. A pilot talks to his crew on the ground with a radio. They look for a safe place to set the balloon down. The crew meets the balloon when it lands. They will let the air out of the balloon and pack it up again. Riding a hot air balloon is an adventure. Where will the wind take you? All right, that takes us through our main story. We're going to go on to the next story, and this is a myth. Uh, this comes from Greek mythology. It's called Bellerophon and Pegasus. Bellerophon and Pegasus, a Greek myth. Bellerophon, Bellerophon, lived long ago in Greece. He wanted to marry King Eobatizes, Eobatizes daughter. But the king wanted to test Bellerophon first. He commanded him to defeat the Chimera, Chimera, a terrible monster. It had a lion's head, a goat's head, and a giant snake for a tail. It was attacking helpless people across the kingdom. Bellerophon worried about his task. How could one man stop the Chimera? He asked the goddess Athena for help. In a dream, she showed him where to find the flying horse Pegasus. Bellerophon woke up from the dream holding a golden bridle. It shone as brightly as the sun. Bellerophon caught Pegasus with the golden bridle and leaped onto the creature's back. Pegasus snorted and stamped his hooves. He stretched his mighty wings with a strong motion. Then he carried his new master up, up, 
up into the sky. They were in flight. Bellerophon and Pegasus soared and circled above the countryside as they hunted the chimera. At last they found the dreadful beast. The monster's heads roared and hissed so loudly that the ground shook. Fire shot from the monster's mouths. Pegasus flew swiftly around the chimera, swooping down and away. Again and again the monster lunged at the flying horse and his rider. Each time it missed them. Bellerophon swung his sword with all his might three times. The monster fell. Bellerophon and Pegasus flew back to King Eobates. To prove his victory, Bellerophon brought King Eobates a strand of lion's mane, a snake's scale, and a goat's horn from the chimera. At last King Eobates agreed to let Bellerophon marry his daughter. Everyone in the kingdom was invited to the wedding feast, and Pegasus got a golden bucket filled with the finest oats in the land. Genre Expository Firsts in Flight Essential Question How are people able to fly? Read about how inventors learned how to fly. Orville and Wilbur Wright stood on a cold, windy beach in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The brothers traveled a long way from their home in Dayton, Ohio, to test their newest flying machine. Flying had been their dream since their father had given them a toy helicopter. The Wright brothers owned a bicycle shop in Dayton. In addition to selling, building, and repairing bicycles, they built flying machines. They flew the first one in 1899. However, the winds weren't strong enough to keep the machine in motion. So they looked for a place where the winds were stronger. As a result, they chose Kitty Hawk. It was not only windy there, but the sandy beaches made for soft landings. Orville and Wilbur Wright On December 17, 1903, the Wright Flyer flew for 12 seconds at Kitty Hawk. Because their first flight was not successful, the Wright brothers learned a lot about flying. As a result, they built a better glider with bigger wings in 1900. This glider did not work very well either. The brothers did not give up. That's why they experimented with a new glider in 1902. Then, in 1903, they built the Wright Flyer, their first airplane with an engine. Flying Firsts By December 17, the brothers were ready to test the right flyer. Orville started up the engines to power the plane. He controlled the plane, while Wilbur watched from the ground. The flyer was launched into the sky. The plane moved in an upward direction, and the flight lasted 12 seconds. The Wright brothers had conquered gravity and unlocked the secrets of flying. Orville and Wilbur kept improving their planes, and their flights became longer. Soon, other people tried to fly airplanes. Will it fly? Do an experiment on flying using paper airplanes. Materials needed. Pencil, paper, ruler. Directions. 1. With a partner, fold two paper airplanes. Make the wing sizes different in each plane. 2. Gently throw one plane. 3. Measure and record how far the paper airplane flew. 4. Take turns throwing the plane four more times. Each time, measure and record how far it flies. 
5. Repeat the experiment with the other airplane. 6. Compare the plane's flights. Then discuss what you learned about flight. Alberto Santos Dumont was the third man in the world to fly a plane with an engine. Alberto Santos Dumont was an inventor and pilot from Brazil. In 1906, he made the first official flight in front of an audience. The next year, the French pilot, Henri Farman, took along a passenger in his plane. They flew for one minute and fourteen seconds. Better Flying Machines Because of these flights, airplane research became popular with inventors. Before long, better planes were traveling longer distances. In 1909, a French pilot flew an airplane across the English Channel. This plane was very different from the Wright brothers' plane. The new plane had only one long wing across its body. It looked a lot like today's airplanes. Soon inventors began building airplanes that could carry more people. By 1920, several new companies offered passengers the chance to fly. Humans had done the impossible. They had figured out how to fly. This is what an airplane looked like in 1930. All right, that takes us to the end of our stories. We're going to get into our comprehension strategy and skill. And again, we're going to focus on rereading so that we catch any information that we missed or to understand things that didn't make sense. And then cause and effect, of course, is when something happens that makes something else happen after it. Reread. Stop and think as you read. Does the text make sense? Reread to make sure you understand. Find text evidence. Do you understand what the Wright brothers learned from their unsuccessful flights? Reread page 306. Because their first flight was not successful, the Wright brothers learned a lot about flying. As a result, they built a better glider with bigger wings in 1900. This glider did not work very well either. The brothers did not give up. That's why they experimented with a new glider in 1902. Then, in 1903, they built the Wright Flyer, their first airplane with an engine. I read that the Wright brothers' first flight was not successful, but they learned a lot about flying. Then they built a better glider with bigger wings. Now... I understand why their unsuccessful flights were important. Cause and Effect A cause is why something happens. An effect is what happens. They happen in time order. Signal words, such as so, as a result, and because, help you find causes and effects. Find text evidence. On page 305, I read that the Wrights had to find a windier place to fly. This is the effect. Now I can find the cause. The wind wasn't strong enough. The signal word, so, helped me find the cause and effect. Graphic Organizer Cause Effect First, the winds weren't strong enough. So the brothers found a place where the winds were stronger. Expository text. First in flight is an expository text. Expository text may present causes and their effects in sequence. May explain a science topic. Includes text features such as headings, photographs, or sidebars.
Find text evidence. I can tell that firsts in flight is an expository text. It gives facts and information about how people first started flying. It includes headings, photographs with captions, and a sidebar. Text features. Sidebar. A sidebar gives more information about a topic. Sometimes a sidebar can be a science experiment or directions showing how to do something. Multiple meaning words. Multiple meaning words have more than one meaning. Find other words in the sentence to help you figure out the correct meaning of a multiple meaning word. Find text evidence. On page 306, I know well can mean a deep hole with water in it or in a good way. The context clue work helps me figure out what well means in this sentence. I think well means in a good way. The glider did not work in a good way. This glider did not work very well either. All right, that takes us to the end of our notes for this week. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. Otherwise, you, I hope you have an amazing week. One thing I did want to mention to you before we finished up, since we were reading about the Wright brothers, is that they were the first ones to fly in a mechanical plane. They were not the first ones to invent flying or to attempt flying. That actually goes back uh, to the year... 800 something uh, by an inventor and a scientist by the name of Abbas Ibn Farnas, who had designed the first flying machine that he made to look like wings, um, that he built after observing and studying how birds fly for a long time. So he was actually one of the first ones who had attempted flying and did it fairly successfully. So the Wright brothers did construct the first can construct a mechanical flying machine, but he was the first one to actually attempt flying. So he's got some really interesting things about his life that you can find online or you can look up um, in YouTube. There's a lot of videos about him, but his history is also a really interesting one. So I do encourage you to take a look at that. I'll put a link into our um, information section in case you're curious about finding out more about him. Otherwise, that's it for the week. I hope you have an amazing day. Take care. Bye-bye.